uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to give it a few minutes here just to get everything started. Just a quick reminder uh, to those that have joined with us already. Uh, you can see and hear the panelists that will be participating in tonight's virtual town hall, uh, but they cannot see or hear you. So as, as the uh, town hall starts to take place, uh, you'll find a Q&A section at the bottom where you can start to submit your questions throughout. Uh, please submit all questions through the Q&A. Uh, there is a chat as well for anybody that uh, would like to make comments or things of that nature as well. But we'll give a few minutes here to let more participants join up and then we'll get started. All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. We'll go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome everyone to the uh, COVID-19 virtual town hall uh, provided by the Arizona Medical Association. Um, we're happy that you're here to join us and excited to have uh, representatives from the Arizona Department of Health Services joining us this evening. Uh, just a quick Zoom housekeeping for all of you. Uh, this is a professional environment. Uh, then we, we want to make sure and ask that everyone remains respectful towards all the participants uh, tonight. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be published for others to view at a later date, uh, both on ARMA social media channels as well as on our website. Um, a quick reminder that you can see and hear us but we cannot see or hear you, please be sure to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen that you'll be able to see a Q&A button to submit questions throughout tonight's town hall. We will try to get to everybody's questions. Uh, if we're unable to get to them at that time or throughout this one hour time frame, uh, we are keeping track of it and we do have some staff members who are tracking all the questions. So we will be able to reach out at a later date as well uh, if unable to get to everybody's questions. Um, the webinar is best access through a computer, so if anybody has called in on their phone, uh, if you have access to a computer, it is best uh, best viewed through there. Um, I just covered the Q&A there for you. So, and then the best viewing as far as uh, this goes is to expand it to the entire window for you. Uh, so tonight's panelists are Jessica Riggler. She's Assistant Director of Public Health Preparedness at ADHS and Dr. Lisa Villarreal, uh, Division Chief or Division of Preparedness Medical Director at Arizona Department of Health Services. We have ARMA's President, Dr. Ross Goldberg, uh, ARMA's CEO, Libby McDaniel, and uh, John Amora is our Director of Government Relations. Uh, real quick, before we pass it along for an update from ADHS, I would like to introduce Dr. Ross Goldberg, who's gonna provide a quick update for everyone. Thanks, Damian. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for participating. We greatly appreciate it. Just again, wanted to thank our guest panelists. Um, as everyone I'm sure is aware, the last few hours have been interesting with the executive order coming out about the extension of the stay at home on May 15th. I am not gonna get into that now. There'll be more coming. I just wanted to take this time to thank our guest panelists because we have a frequent conversations with them and they 
have been more than willing to talk and listen to what we have to say. And we appreciate them taking our feedback and bringing that to the governor's office and allowing us to have a voice in all this. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to them, but I want to just publicly thank them for all they do. And the fact that we have the opportunity to participate with them is greatly appreciated. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Goldbrook, for that. Um, this is Jessica Riggler. We are thrilled to be able to participate and to speak to you all today um, and to answer questions that you have. But Lisa and I thought that we'd start with just giving you kind of a general overview of what's going on um, with COVID-19 in Arizona, uh, as well as try to address some of the questions that have kind of come up surrounding this issue as well. So I'll just start. Um, with a brief overview of what's going on in the state as far as our case, our case counts, um, our surveillance data, and where we think we're heading or where the data is trending. I'm sure most of you have had a chance to look at our dashboard and that we have posted online and we continue to add to this on a weekly basis. And so you'll see additional tabs popping up over the weeks or additional data points in there. And um, to date, as of today, we're reporting over 7,000 cases of COVID-19 and those are confirmed and probable cases. Um, specifically 7,202 cases to date with 304 deaths reported. Um, we've had nearly 70,000 Arizonans tested for COVID-19 and that's the PCR testing. Uh, and about 9% overall of our cases are, po or, excuse me, of our tests are coming back positive right now. But we've got additional data on our website that's showing the trend of percent positivity. And so we've seen it increasing pretty steadily over the last several weeks. Uh, up from about 9% a month ago, percent positivity. And um, we went up to 10% and 11%. Um, and now we're coming back down a little bit. But I think one of the caveats that we want to make sure that people keep in mind when they're looking at both our case data and our percent positivity data for the laboratory testing is that this data lags. And so you really have to wait um, an additional week before uh, after the weekend to get a sense of what's going on. So right now we're almost looking back two weeks at the data to get a true picture of what's happening. And that's just because uh, it takes a while for people to go in and to get tested for those test results to come back for them to be reported to the department and then for us to do investigations on that with our county health partners. Um, and so that's a brief look at the data. But if you look at our confirmed cases by day, you can see we continue to have um, this steady increase in cases as you draw uh, a curve over or a line over that epi curve that's there. Um, we have predictable decreases in collection dates uh, over the weekends though. So I think we're still looking like we're trending upwards in cases in Arizona. We think part of that is due probably to a true increase in the number of people infected, but part of that is due to additional availability of laboratory testing in the state. And so the more we test for this, the more we're going to find, which will drive our case numbers up. Um, but that's a reason that we look at other surveillance indicators as well as case counts uh, when we're trying to identify what the true trends of COVID-19 are in Arizona. And so we have a tab on our dashboard that looks at syndromic surveillance too. Um, and that really is the percentage of ED visits or percentage of inpatient admissions that have COVID-like illness symptoms reported through the medical record. Uh, so these aren't people that are confirmed to be positive for COVID, just people who present at a hospital um, with COVID-like illness symptoms. And we report that data on our dashboard as well. If you take a look at at that you can see we're actually heading in the right direction. We were going up um, quite a bit for a while where we got upwards of 7%, almost 8% of our emergency department visits uh, were for COVID-like illness. And that's trended down over the last couple of weeks. We're sitting at about four and a half percent or so of our inpatient ED uh, visits as COVID-like illness right now. It looks like it's leveling off a little bit, but it's not as low as we'd like it to be. Um, we consider our epidemic threshold to be about 2% of visits. And so we're really looking to continue to come back down towards that 2%. Um, so I don't think that we're out of the woods yet as far as the data goes, but we continue to monitor it and expect to see um, changes in case counts, of course, because of testing changes. Uh, so that's sort of the general overview of the data. And after we're done talking, we can entertain any questions about that. Uh, but I'd like to, kind of transition into some of the public health actions we're taking around this. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to know is to talk more about the testing. Uh, testing is, is being enhanced uh, currently as we speak. We've heard from many labs that they have plenty of capacity to do testing. And I'm talking about the laboratory testing side, not the specimen collection side right now. And so there's additional capacity in the state uh, of Arizona for our laboratories to test more patients. Um, right now, we don't anticipate a supply in reagents at this time. 
Uh, we have also heard that there are additional test kits available, those specimen collection kits, your nasal swabs and those kinds of things for more tests to be done on patients. And that's one of the reasons that the department is moving forward as one of our strategies with um, this testing blitz, which you may have seen advertised. We've got a website up, it's azhealth.gov slash testing blitz. And this is an opportunity for people to sign up to do testing on uh, a couple Saturdays in May, starting this Saturday, in order to increase our testing to get some better awareness of what's going on out in Arizona um, related to COVID-19. And so we've got several partners that have signed up to participate in that. And then one of the other strategies that we're the most excited about related to um, testing in Arizona is to roll out a strategy to increase testing for uh, long-term care and residential health care facilities because that's really where we know there's the most vulnerable individuals in Arizona in those congregate settings. And so we're working uh, with our local health partners in order to uh, increase testing in these settings uh, by going in and doing some testing of residents and staff, uh, as well as uh, asymptomatic or symptomatic patients in those settings. There are, of course, limitations to that. For example, uh, we need to ensure there's appropriate PPE in the state to do that kind of testing. Um, as well as the testing collection supplies to do that. And so we're working through those issues right now um, as it relates to testing. Part of that though really ties into our general surveillance strategy for public health to get a better picture of what's going on um, on the ground in Arizona as it relates to COVID-19. And then there's another piece that I'm sure you've all heard about uh, in, in the media and some of the reopening plans that you might have seen, which is related to contact tracing. Contact tracing, of course, being once you get uh, a case in that's reported to public health and the public health investigator will interview that case, figure out who they were in close contact with and then follow up with those contacts to ask them to monitor for symptoms, to stay home self quarantined uh, for a certain number of days. And we're really working to augment our uh, contact tracing in the state of Arizona in partnership with our local health departments. We're working on adopting some additional technology features that will allow us to do um, better management of contacts, and then we're onboarding and training a significant number of staff, uh, university partners, volunteers, in order to create this whole contact tracing workforce across the state so that we can better augment our contact tracing. This is especially important as we get more testing and we find out more positives. We want to make sure we can follow up with contacts of all of those. In addition, if the state is moving towards a phased reopening, we want to make sure that we've got that infrastructure of contact tracers in place when we do see some additional cases associated with a phased reopening so the public health can follow up and ensure that contacts understand that they've been exposed and can appropriately take prevention steps. So those are kind of some broad brush strokes about those actions that are going on. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa now to talk about um, some additional things. Good evening, Good evening. Um, Lisa Villarreal. I'm the medical director for public health preparedness at the Arizona Department of Health Services. And I'm so excited to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about the Arizona Surge Line. This is a brand new endeavor for Arizona and in an unprecedented collaboration between hospital systems, the CMOs and hospital transfer centers came together to create this Arizona Surge Line hosted by ADHS to help manage hospital transfers um, of uh, COVID-19 across the state. So there's four components to the surge line. The first is we're working to expedite transfer um, of patients to a higher level of care. So we're talking about um, getting access to uh, med surge beds or ICU beds or ventilators and ECMO. Uh, second uh, component is we would like to expedite transfer of patients to lower level of care. So to SNFs and long-term care facilities and other alternate care sites. Uh, the third component is um, we plan to provide backup for transportation of these patients during transfers um, when resources get scarce. And the fourth is um, we will be providing a real-time clinical consultation specifically for critical care and palliative care. Um, it's been going really well. The process has been uh, really interesting. Uh, nearly every hospital in Arizona is participatory. Uh, in order to participate, it does mean that they need to maintain for us near, near real-time bed and ventilator visibility, and they're doing that through, a, uh, most of which are doing uh, that through a centralized platform. The line itself is staffed by EMCTs and critical care, palliative care physicians, uh, and that dispatch center uses a centralized algorithm to figure out where to place patients, and so there's an equal kind of uh, load, I guess you would say, of COVID-19 uh, across uh, facilities in the state. 
Uh, there aren't many states that have pulled this off statewide. There are examples in LA and in Detroit, uh, not all of which, um, I think Minnesota has one as well, but not all of which have that last aspect, which is the clinical consultation aspect. Uh, so right now what our protocols are, um, are to send uh, people to that consultation line when they're unable to acquire a transport or a transfer for their patient because of triage protocols or because of better ventilator uh, or transport availability. Uh, we are looking for more uh, volunteer uh, critical care and palliative care specialists to help us staff this line. There is a stipend that is associated uh, with working with this on this. Um, we are rolling this out in stages. Uh, the first stage that was rolled out was uh, that first part, which is expediting transfer of COVID-19 patients to a higher level of care. So it's a ventilator ICU and, and so on. It's been live for I think 12 or 13 days now and we've moved nearly 100 patients uh, across Arizona, mostly from rural to urban settings. Uh, by the end of the week, uh, we should have a centralized transportation backup uh, set up for all IHS and 638 facilities. Next week, we should have our clinical consultation line uh, stood up, and the week after that, we should have our, our um, um, expediting transfers to lower level of care aspects set up. That's all I have for that. Great, and then this is Jessica again. I just wanted to touch a little bit on um, elective surgeries, and I think we'll probably have a fair number of questions about this topic too. Um, I am sure that you are all aware uh, that Governor DC signed an executive order to allow for resumption of elective surgeries under specific criteria, and we've got guidance on that posted on our website right now, um, including uh, an attestation form that facilities can complete if they're looking to resume elective surgeries, as well as FAQs um, to support that. Of course, we haven't covered all FAQs at this time, and so we're looking to add more, and I'm hoping some of the questions we get today will um, help us add to those FAQ documents so that we can make sure that we're answering all the questions out there or the majority of them. Um, at this point, we've had over 1,100 attestations completed for practices looking to resume elective surgeries. That number had actually uh, increased in the time from when Governor Ducey was given the number uh, before the press conference today to when he announced it during the press conference today. Um, and we've had a lot of questions about elective surgeries that have come through to you. Um, some regarding pre-op testing and whether that's required for certain types of surgeries as well as concerns related to testing supplies. Um, as I mentioned earlier at this time in Arizona, laboratories have indicated to us that they've got adequate specimen collection supplies that they can share with their healthcare partners who are contracted with them for testing. Um, but we're interested to hear if you continue to run into barriers um, with your laboratory providing you those supplies. Um, and then in general, as far as whether or not the testing is required for um, preoperative patients for certain types of surgeries right now, um, we're continuing to re review the literature so that we can um, make sure that we're thinking this through thoughtfully. But at this time, the executive order is in place to require that pre-op testing regardless of specialty. Um, we will, of course, continue to take feedback of, about this and have had um, some significant feedback already to the department that we're reviewing related to those requirements. Um, and I think that's all I'll say about executive orders and we can take a look at um, questions that come up around this too. And Damien, I think that is the bulk of our uh, update from the department. Lisa, do you have other things that you wanted to touch on? I don't think so. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, thank you very much for that quick update. I'm just going to remind uh, all the panelists here to make sure that we uh, mute ourselves in between talking just so we don't uh, have any echoes going on here. Uh, and then it's just a, also a reminder for everyone too to please continue to submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, looks like we got a few questions that were submitted uh, via the chat as well. So I'll try to address the back and forth here, but moving forward, if anybody has any questions that do come up, please do submit them through the Q&A uh, function at the bottom here. Looks like one question was sent through the chat here was how many people would you envision being a part of the contact tracing team across the state? So right now, uh, we've tried to put together some pretty rough estimates for needs for the contact tracing team. Um, we're actually looking at trying to onboard about 400 or more individuals to help support this effort. Of course, we'll phase it up as we go. And so we're going to start with a smaller number, get some training out and train the trainer, and then we'll continue to ramp that process up. 
Um, but right now we're looking at about 400 potentially. Great, thank you. Uh, looks like another question here that was uh, submitted tonight is, are private labs and physician offices reporting all uh, COVID-19 tests to you or only positives? Uh, and then do the physicians submit to you on standard form or for reportable disease or the labs? We are collecting laboratory reports on COVID-19 positives as well as negatives. And so the laboratories report to us through electronic laboratory reporting and labs that don't have that capability because they're smaller, that technology is not in place, um, either fax us reports that we data enter or we have a flat fire file transfer process. Um, but we are getting both positive and negative laboratory results coming in for COVID-19. Great, thank you. Uh, and then I'm gonna, so just so everybody knows, I'm going to bounce back and forth between questions that were submitted prior to uh, the start of tonight's town hall too. So we will try to get to answering everybody's questions that were submitted before as well as during, but we are tracking, just as a reminder for everybody, we are tracking the questions that are being answered and we'll, uh, we have your contact information. So if we're unable to answer them tonight, we will be sure to follow up uh, with an answer after tonight's town hall. Uh, see a question that was submitted prior to tonight. Uh, we have been informed that testing of asymptomatic patients prior to endoscopic procedures is required. Uh, this is not something that's required in other states from what we know. Are there concerns of overutilization of resources, testing supplies, uh, and then will the demand of testing outrun the supply of kits? Will labs get overrun and not be able to process the specimens and contact uh, the ordering physician in an adequate time frame? There are a lot of parts to that question. Um, so I'll take a stab at it and then Lisa, please fill in uh, if there's anything that you think that I missed in there. Um, so in terms of the testing supply, as I mentioned, we have been in communication with Arizona Laboratories. It does appear uh, that they've got the supplies needed that they can uh, provide to practices who they're contracted with. Um, so we don't believe that that's a specific issue right now. Um, and we also, for PPE, expect that there's adequate PPE supply for practices that are resuming their surgeries in order to conduct testing as well. Um, for the laboratory turnaround time, I think the last time I checked the numbers, we were looking at about a one and a half day turnaround time from the time the specimen was collected to the time that it gets um, reported. And so right now, I believe that we're still at capacity. We've, or excuse me, we're still well within capacity to get good turnaround time for our laboratories. Um, and have again heard from laboratories that they have ample capacity, that they're testing well under what they could be testing right now um, as far as volume goes. And so I think that we're going to be okay that way, but we are always open um, to feedback, as I said before, if we're seeing um, shortages in the supply chain that we can take a look at what the requirements are and what we might be able to do to meet those gaps also. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, another question that was submitted tonight is uh, do physicians who perform surgical procedures under local anesthesia uh, need to attest in order to perform those procedures in the office? So the executive orders have been specific to surgeries rather than uh, medical procedures. I believe that medical procedures were not included in the executive order as a specific requirement. Lisa, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that. Okay. Right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, will the COVID... 19 uh, patients going to the SNFs be sent uh, to COVID only SNFs or will they be uh, interdispersed with negative patients as well? Is there anything that ADHS might have to add on that? Uh, this is Jessica. So it, it's really up to that conversation between the discharging facility and the receiving facility on um, patients that, that they will accept. We've certainly heard some potential concerns about discharges to skilled nursing facilities, um, but there's not a requirement that uh, patients can only go to a COVID or non-COVID uh, skilled nursing facility at this time. Hi, this is Lisa. I can just add that we've been working uh, with the post-acute care settings, uh, really trying to understand what's going on um, and trying to identify. It's actually 
Um, it can be sometimes a little bit challenging to find a facility, a post-acute post care facility that will accept uh, COVID patients. So right now I can tell you that we're just starting to gather through word of mouth, through reaching out, through different discharge coordinators across the hospital systems, trying to just get a master list of who is accepting uh, these COVID patients. Uh, some of them are COVID only SNFs, some of them are not, but they have separate isolation wings or isolation protocols that allow them to accept. It's been a really interesting uh, um, uh, world, I guess, to get um, more involved in. Great, thank you. Um, looks like here, a uh, question that was submitted prior tonight. Uh, there's concern for excessive testing uh, may exhaust the other needed resources such as PPE. Is this something that ADHS is looking into and preparing for? Oh, Jessica, you're on mute, I Got believe. It. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I think one of the considerations for resumption of elective surgeries is that facilities have ample personal protective equipment on hand in order to um, perform all the requirements uh, that they need to perform, which would include testing as well as having that 14 day supply of uh, PPE on hand. This is Libby McDaniel. I would just add that if there are questions around supply of PPE, ARMA um, has an initiative where we have provided an avenue for our members and others in the, in the community to purchase PPE through multiple channels um, in partnership with the Maricopa County Medical Society. So we're happy to provide continued information on that for any entity that needs PPE. Thank you, Libby. Yes, and that information is available on ARMA's website at azmed.org. Uh, you can click on the, the banner at the top of the page that pops up on our homepage, or you can also find it under the COVID-19 resource page available to, to the public on there. Uh, let's see another question. Uh, are there any plans to ascertain community prevalence using serologic testing in the state or has this been done elsewhere? Yeah, so seroprevalence studies are something that the department is very interested in and in trying to better understand this. We don't have a specific uh, widespread plan for this, but we are partnering with the University of Arizona um, who's looking to do up to 250,000 uh, serologic tests around the state of Arizona in all 15 counties. Uh, the sampling plan for that, I'm not sure we'll make it generalizable to the entire population of Arizona, but it will give us some additional data on seroprevalence in the state. Great, thank you. Uh, another question that was submitted prior to tonight, uh, if, if the patient had been tested or tests have been performed for another procedure, will they need to be retested? And is there any type of in-between window for, for testing that's considered acceptable by ADHS? So we don't have specific guidance that we've put out about this. One of the things that we would ask is that facilities are using their discretion on this based on the exposure history of the patient. And so if you understand, you know, where the patient has been prior to surgery or since their last test um, and where they might have gone, then that would be a point to use discretion on whether or not you think they may have realistically been exposed to COVID in the interim. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see another question here tonight. Uh, they, I've not seen any reported data on hospital acquired COVID-19 uh, in those patients who are in the hospital for non-COVID-19 reasons. Uh, is this something that ADHS is monitoring at this time or has been monitoring? We also aren't collecting specific data on hospital acquired COVID-19 um, right now as part of our healthcare associated infections program. Um, it might be something that we could go back to look at in, uh, in the future as we kind of look retrospectively back about how this outbreak has been unfolding. But at this time, we're not going to look for a nosocomial infection of COVID-19. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, another question that was submitted prior to tonight. Uh, is there any thought or consideration uh, to modifying the criteria 
to require for uh, COVID-19 testing before elective surgical procedures can be started. Uh, so at this time, uh, we're just looking at adherence to the existing executive order, but we are open to receiving input if there are additional considerations that um, folks would like us to take into account. Um, and we've been receiving some of those to date too. So we'll continue to review those as well as what the evidence is telling us um, from studies that are occurring both in the United States and internationally to help guide those decisions. Great, let's see another question here that was submitted prior to tonight. Uh, I understand the PCR nasopharyngeal swab test can remain positive long after symptoms have resolved by many weeks. Is there data showing how long the test remains positive percentage wise in groups of patients after symptoms have been resolved? Hi, this is Lisa. I, I can probably take this one. You know, the issue of the PCRs remaining positive for prolonged periods of time has been an issue. Um, everywhere, but also here in this country since the first U.S. COVID case that occurred in Washington, uh, and then shortly thereafter, the first case that occurred here in Arizona, as these cases remained positive, PCR positive for weeks, and therefore remained in isolation. Um, it has been a struggle for both public health departments and individuals since then. Uh, interesting, though, that a few new studies have come out, including uh, ones that I think are being posted uh, maybe tomorrow uh, that has provided some new information on this. Uh, the first is a study out of China, uh, out of Wuhan, China. Um, la the author's last name is Zhao, Z-H-O-U. And so they looked at 41 discharged patients with severe COVID-19 in Wuhan, uh, cases that occurred in February and March of this past year, and they did OP swabs, and they found that the mean duration of viral shedding from symptom on onset was 31 days. That is higher uh, than uh, what other studies have kind of circled around, which has been around 20 days. Um, there's a second study that came out of Germany, I believe, out of Europe that was published online April 1. The first author is Wolfel, W-O-L-F-E-L. So in that study, they looked at nine uh, mild or moderate cases of COVID-19, and they either pulled OP or NP swabs, and they also tested for viral load. And what they found is that the virus was readily isolated in culture, so infectious, during the first week of symptoms. So culture positive during the first week of symptoms, but none of those cultures became positive if they were taken in samples after day eight, in spite of having these high uh, viral loads. So that's interesting, right? So if they're actually only infectious potentially for you know, eight days uh, of symptoms. Um, there is also another study that, that's coming out of CDC. It was presented at CSTE, and I believe it will be posted. Um, I don't think it was posted today, so maybe tomorrow. I haven't seen it, but apparently it also showed that there were no culture positive nasal swabs after day nine. Um, so in summary, then, it looks like until uh, the infectious uh, virus seems to be around uh, until day eight or nine of symptoms, it looks like we uh, anticipated, of course, that PCR may be detecting inactive virus for prolonged periods of time, you know, outside of that actual infective window. And so with all these different pieces of evidence coming together, we hope that there will be a change in CDC recommendations, um, as, and particularly when it comes to isolation. Uh, I think, though, um, we'll have to see what happens and see how exact what the methods were in that CDC study and how large it was and what exactly they found. Thank you, Dr. Villarreal. Uh, looks like there's another question that was submitted tonight. Uh, the executive order specifically addresses a robust COVID-19 testing plan for testing healthcare workers and patients for elective non-essential surgeries. Uh, is screening questions, and there are a couple questions here in a row, but is, uh, is screening questions and temp check with appropriate access to testing meet the requirements of the executive order? Uh, what is the definition of elective non-essential surgeries? And then uh, they also ask, uh, are endoscopy procedures exempt from the order since these are not surgeries? So uh, this is... Jessica, um, and I'll start in on this, and Lisa, please jump in if you feel like I'm missing any of the pieces in here. So related to screening questions and temperature check with appropriate access, um, related to that one, I think um, we want to ensure that there is actual testing occurring here um, and not just the symptom check and screening is the intent of the executive order. 
Um, for definition of elective non-essential surgeries, we're referring back to CMS, who has a guide for um, surgeries, and they have different tiers for the um, what's considered essential surgery versus elective surgery. Um, and so that's a good reference point on that guide. Uh, and that's the similar thing where I would refer back to for high-risk colon cancer screening versus a cosmetic surgery. We don't believe that those are on the same um, kind of playing field versus on their essentialness. Um, for lack of a better word. Um, and then procedures and uh, surgeries have been kind of separated as part of that executive order. Lisa, is there anything you wanna add on that? No, okay, thanks. I do wanna add one thing though, if there was a question off that too. I, I would point everyone back to the FAQs because it defines what an at-risk healthcare worker is. And the, they did a really good job of saying who we're talking about needs the testing. So it's not every single person walking in the operating room. If there is a definition there that to look at, they did a really great job of defining that since people are getting confused and went out of their way to define at risk healthcare workers. So I'd go would look at the FAQs to see exactly who they're talking about before you start breaking out the swabs on everyone. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. To, to meet the recommendations for elective surgery, how often will healthcare wor workers need to be tested for? Uh, quote, robust testing once a month, once a week, or uh, what does ADHS consider robust? Yeah, so I think part of that goes back to what Dr. Goldberg was pointing out in the FAQs related to um, our focus really on at-risk healthcare workers. And the, those are healthcare workers who would have significant exposures um, or are elderly or high risk for complications from COVID-19. Um, and we're, we are requiring that facilities put policies and procedure that kind of defines what that cadence would look like for them. Uh, let's see another question tonight. Uh, is there, I, I'm going to try and summarize uh, some of these a little along it here, just to make it a little easier to answer. But is there uh, are there any concerns with as far as lab capacity across the state as we continue to ramp up testing? Uh, looks like there's some concerns about 36-hour uh, turnaround originally, but now the next day they're being told three to five days. Uh, is ADHS in contact with the labs across the state? that are working on the, the testing as you continue to try and ramp it up? Yeah, we are in consistent contact with our testing laboratories around the state, and we've got a great network of labs through our state public health lab as well to continue to maintain those conversations so that we'll be able to track kind of what's going on and what capacity issues may exist, um, as well as having some avenues where we could potentially ramp up testing if that becomes uh, necessary. Great, thank you. And uh, I'm not sure if, uh, Dr. Villarreal, when you talked earlier about the, the long-term care facilities, this is another question that can't come earlier, but is there any specific task force addressing long-term care facilities and how they're working moving forward? Hi, yeah, Jessica, you might have to help me finish the question, but I mean, I'm only working on them uh, with one aspect, which is I'm trying to figure out, uh, my, not just me, my group is trying to figure out who is accepting these patients. And if they're not accepting these patients, why is it? Is it because of lack of PPE? Is it lack of understanding of the protocols? Is it a lack of funding? Is it a lack of staffing? Uh, so we're more trying to explore uh, what's going on. Of course, uh, right now there's certainly, at least by our numbers, there are certainly not enough post-acute care um, facilities that um, are needed. Uh, especially if we are to about to walk into a secondary surge or um, once uh, we get into the season's flu season. But Jessica, did you want to say anything else about, I think you already covered the testing um, uh, rollout of all the SNFs. Is there anything else? Yeah, I mean, I guess the only other thing that I would add is that we're working to put additional supports in place around infection control in uh, skilled nursing facilities so that we can provide uh, in concert with our local county health departments uh, more robust technical assistance for infection control um, prior to COVID cases being identified as well as when COVID cases might be identified in a facility so that facilities have those additional supports from the department. Great, thank you both. Um, with numerous testing or with numerous specialties operating in outpatient centers across the valley, uh, there's concern for this exhausting the testing supplies uh, is the Department of Health Services looking into the reevaluating re whether testing needs to be done 
on patients in all specialties, or is there any chance that this will be revised and the guidelines and the order moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think we continue to review the literature and um, keep track of what's going on across the country and internationally to help make some of these assessments uh, to determine what potential risks could be for certain types of surgeries or specialties um, related to COVID-19. There's just so much unknown about this particular disease, its transmission, um, how it manifests in patients, that it's very difficult um, to give kind of broad brush uh, answers where you can exclude this and, and, and not that right now because we just don't know enough yet. And so we're taking into account the literature as well as um, feedback that the department's getting in order to make decisions moving forward. Jamie, I just want to point out because one thing also, there is an article out there, again, there's limited data. There's a Lancet article from earlier this year from China about elective surgeries and COVID patients during the pandemic. They were unknown COVID beforehand. They operated on all of them. They were all COVID positive. They all developed symptoms afterwards and had, some of them had significant problems. So there is limited data. There is limited data out there and I'm happy to share with whoever from the, the call just so you can see that article about why what's driving some of the concern is that you can be asymptomatic, have it, and then the, cert, the operation will trigger something afterwards. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of unknowns still. I wanna support our colleagues in DHS. I think it's better to be cautious. I know it's a, it's a, it's a resource poll and it's changing things. We're trying to figure it out at my hospital right now, but this is not a time where you wanna have someone who's asymptomatic, you trigger something you don't know, and then now they're in their ICU afterwards post-op. So we have to be mindful of that. Hi, Dr. Goldberg. This is Lisa. You know, I really appreciate you actually sending that article over to us. We were reading it. I mean, the numbers are pretty staggering. Looking at uh, that, uh, that case series, um, I think it was a total of 44% of patients getting elective surgeries um, ended up in the ICU, uh, which is kind of a stunning uh, outcome that we saw. And just to scare everyone else, it was 20% of them died. And there was 34 cases that were all elective surgery, asymptomatic COVID patients who's all developed symptoms post-op in China. Again, it's one study, I get that, but I don't know if any of you want to be a randomized control trial to see if this works. I don't want to be the guy doing that. So I'm going to go by the data we have. And the hope is that what I would recommend everyone doing though, is if you want to get the DHS good data for every patient you test, follow them afterwards and see who develops the symptoms, who, do who doesn't and then we can map it out better. So we can help provide the data, we should all participate. So every operation your hospital does, follow your patients up, you know, when you do your standard post-op visits, see how they're doing. If they're asymptomatic and they were negative, when we have a large enough data sample, we may be able to provide better data and change things based on the outcomes. Great, thank you. Uh, so there was another question that was submitted prior to the start of tonight asking for some clarification uh, in the FAQ document. Uh, I guess it's the, regarding at-risk healthcare workers in subsection C uh, of the FAQ document that indicates that the worker's age and medical conditions should be considered. How can employers avoid the invasion of privacy of any employee who would not wish to share their medical conditions? Uh, and then in addition, the criteria is to include staff that have provided care to a known or unknown COVID-19 case without minimum PPE etc. Uh, they're just asking for some clarification and offer any recommendations that ADHS may have on this. Yeah, I mean, I think this is definitely a place to get your um, risk management involved in some of those conversations uh, with, with staff related to the medical condition side of things. And then Lisa, I don't know if you want to take the second half of the question. Someone walked in my office while Damien was asking it. I'm sorry, can the question be repeated? Yeah, they were, they were just asking for some clarification uh, with subsection C in the FAQ document that covers at-risk healthcare workers. Uh, there was, an, in addition, the criteria is to include staff that have provided care to known or unknown COVID-19 cases uh, without minimum PPE, as well as asking how can employers avoid the evasion of privacy of an employee who would not wish to share their medical conditions. They were asking for some clarification on this section and some recommendations from ADHS. I'm not sure I have anything else to add. Okay, great. Uh, let's see here, another question. Uh, 
and this might have been answered earlier within the PCR test, but uh, any clinical significance of a positive PCR test weeks after symptoms resolution, uh, specifically, are these patients considered infectious? Uh, did you have anything more that you wanted to add on what you had discussed earlier, or do you feel that covered most of it? No, I think uh, just we're starting to get the studies that support what we've all always thought, which is they keep, they're not infectious for that entire time and we're picking up kind of dead virus. Uh, so, but I think, um, you know, we've been sitting on this for a while and it's really nice in the past couple of weeks and in the, you know, the past day um, that we're getting more and more data around this to kind of um, circle around so that we could potentially have a new policy coming forth federally pretty soon. Uh, let's see, another question from tonight here. Um, given today's news about, I'm going to try and say this, rem, Remdesivir, uh, where Dr. Fauci stated it is standard of care, how is Arizona preparing to keep adequate supplies? Hi, this is Lisa. I actually am a little bit behind on that news story. Uh, of course, we have been following the studies uh, with that particular drug and they have been looking promising. Um, I just have to get caught up and figure out if it's still considered um, an investigational drug that we're going to have to go through um, to try get access to that drug or I don't know if something has changed today uh, to make it that it's more easily accessible. I don't know if he said it was standard of care or he was cautiously optimistic. And I know the WHO has not come out and said that they're like 100% behind it yet. They need more data. I don't know. I hear, I don't think I heard standard of care, though. I heard that they're hoping because with the good results. But I don't think anyone's made a that declarative a claim yet. Apologies. I just saw the headline. Unless I'm missing something. I thought that's what I heard this morning, today. Just uh, whoever asked the question put standard of care. And I don't, I don't recall hearing that. I could be wrong, but who knows? See another question. Thank you both for that. Uh, another question here from tonight. An orthopedic surgeon in China reported that many times uh, pre-op evaluations were done using CT scans. Uh, is this something that Arizona has is considering or is looking into? Hi, this is Lisa. Yeah, you know that was that uh, there, there was. Um, there were publications on using CTs as the screening tool uh, pretty early on out of China uh, when they were, did not have testing capabilities. Um, it was attempted here in the United States early on um, also uh, when we didn't have testing uh, and they just found that the turnaround in the CT bay would just knock out the CT bay um, for an entire shift, you know, or for half the night as they had to do um, a terminal clean. So, so far, I don't, I don't believe in the U.S. that this has been implemented as kind of a standard screening procedure for COVID-19. Uh, let's see another question here tonight. Uh, we have been directing volunteers to the uh, opportunity to sign up through the Arizona Disaster Healthcare Volunteers. Uh, have you had a need to call upon any healthcare volunteers up to this point in time, or have all needs been delivered by existing workforce? This is Jessica. I love this question. Thank you for whoever asked this. Um, yeah, we actually have had to call up some healthcare volunteers as a part of this response very early on um, as things were happening up up north in, in Navajo Nation um, and to pull up some, some volunteers to go up there to support one of the facilities up there um, with inpatient care. Uh, so that resource there, um, we are so, so appreciative of everyone who's registered through the system, um, who's willing to volunteer their time. We, it looks like we're in pretty good shape here in the state right now from healthcare needs, but you never know when those point needs are going to come up. And um, it's just a fabulous resource for us to call on. And we've got eyes towards flu season to see what might happen then. And so it may be something we'll need to use in the future as well. Hi, this is Lisa. Yeah, this is just my follow-up plug that it would be really great uh, if we could keep building uh, the number of people that we can call upon in case uh, things turn really bad here later this year. Uh, so it's a pretty simple procedure and I think I got certified uh, within 20 minutes. This is Libby. Uh, I think just to follow up on that question, you had talked a little bit about the surge line and the staffing of surge line. Um, you know, as we talked earlier in the week, you were still looking for resources, both critical care and palliative care. 
specialist to help staff that. Is that still something where you're looking for resources from the medical community or how is that looking from a staffing perspective? Yeah, thanks. That's a, um, yeah, I'm happy to, happy to talk about this. You know, um, the, the idea is that this is primarily, the surge line is primarily an interfacility transfer center, kind of a centralized, a centralized way uh, to place patients with COVID um, across the state and at the appropriate level of care. Um, the only time that a clinical consultation with a critical care specialist or a palliative care specialist that would come into play would be when there is no transport, uh, there are no beds, or by triage protocols, uh, they are not accepted at the destination facility. That is the only time then that we would patch someone through to receive a real-time critical care or palliative care consult, uh, because basically now that requesting physician is gonna have to manage that patient in place. Um, we do need more palliative care and critical care specialists. I thought uh, we initially had a, had a big push, uh, but before we can push you forward uh, into be, being put into scheduling, we do need people to make sure that they register an ESARVIP, that disaster medical volunteer, because that does potentially give you the highest liability coverage. Uh, and so we kind of stalled out uh, and really uh, swelling our ranks, I guess, in, uh, for those two um, for those two specialties. So yes, if you have any colleagues, please have them email surgeline at azdhs.gov. Uh, we will follow up with them tomorrow. Terrific, thank you. Here, um, Just while you find a question, someone did send me that Dr. Fauci did say standard of care, so I do stand corrected. I just wanna make sure everyone's aware that yes, uh, that he did say that. We all love Dr. Fauci. Uh, let's see here. Under another question that was submitted, understand the hospital system has received clarification that healthcare workers do not need to be tested and screening appropriate access to testing is adequate. Is this something that is, is this correct? Uh, and can we get the same clarification uh, for the plan regarding patients as well? So I am not familiar with this particular clarification that healthcare workers don't need to be tested and screened or that screening is appropriate um, as long as there's access to testing, but we can run that down um, and add that in our FAQs if that is truly uh, an answer to that question. Great, and I think this might be another question for follow-up at a later time, but there's a question regarding uh, how the standards that are set forth by the governor for resuming elective surgeries will be enforced as well. Yeah, so as far as enforcement of standards for elective surgeries, we are requesting um, that there's a form that's completed for any facility that is requesting this exemption to elective surgeries and it requires an attestation to a number of things and um, that the facility is required to meet per the executive order as well as a electronic signature of an executive with that healthcare facility. Um, those forms all get filed with ADHS's licensing department. Um, and so they've got the ability to follow up if that's necessary. We also do some cross matching on those related to some of the data that's reported into our EM resource system, um, as far as bed availability, PPE availability, and those kinds of things. Uh, let's see another question tonight. Uh, Sonora Quest is offering their antibody test without a doctor's order starting in May. Uh, how should the public interpret those results? Will all labs offer this antibody test without a doctor's order in the future? Yeah, so Arizona um, has a law that passed a few years ago to allow for direct access testing for um, specific tests that laboratories indicate uh, for patients to go in and get tested without the doctor's order. Um, and as Damien just read, Sonora Quest is offering that direct access testing for antibody testing for COVID-19. Uh, we are very hopeful that our partners communicate um, what serology tests or antibody tests do or do not mean at this time because um, there's still a lot of unknowns there. And so I think it's very important to make sure that communication point gets across that the antibody test may tell you if you've been exposed to COVID-19, although it, it may still demonstrate a cross reaction to another coronavirus infection in the past. Um, it does not necessarily tell you that you're immune to COVID-19. 
um, nor how long that immunity might last if you are in fact immune. And so I think there's a lot of clamoring for these antibody tests from the public. They're being offered all over the place and um, the department has tried to put out strong messaging about what those tests can and can't tell us. Um, although we're hopeful that in the future as we get a broader understanding, they will be one additional tool in our toolbox for public health uh, prevention and uh, intervention and control strategies as we understand more about people's immune status and what those tests mean. It's possible we'll see more labs offering that as a direct access test, but we're not sure where they're, where they're at with that now. And let the membership know that as DHS comes out with more guidelines, we'll make sure that we have it available as well to provide you that information um, so that we can keep on the straight line with all of it. Yes, everyone can get an antibody test now, just no one knows what any of it means. So you can get one and then have an answer that doesn't really mean much at the moment. So um, you know, to be blunt, that's kind of where we are, but we'll be here to help provide the correct information as DHS puts it out. Great, and I'm gonna throw one more question out here that was submitted tonight and then we'll uh, wrap up from there. Uh, are there any resources being pushed out for first responders, frontline healthcare workers uh, in the terms of mental health response or debriefing uh, such as warm lines or peer-to-peer -peer support uh, on top of what, the, what crisis response and 211 is providing? That's probably something that we'll have to take back to get um, answers back to ARMA on. I know there has been some work in this field and others might be aware of um, non kind of department sponsored activities that are going on around this as part of our major disaster declaration that we submitted to um, the federal government. We included a request for some, some of that crisis support as well. Um, but I, I haven't heard an update on where we're at with the approval of that, but we are expecting and hoping that there'll be some additional dollars in the state related to COVID for um, some of that uh, counseling or resources to support that. Lisa, do you have anything else on that front? I love the question, so. Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna pull up my screen here real quick with just some follow-up. Uh, so we'd like to thank everyone for participating in tonight's town hall. Uh, just a quick, Reminder here that uh, this town hall was recorded, will be available on ARMA's website within the next few days. Uh, if you have any further questions, I know there are some questions still that we weren't unable to answer. So ARMA staff will definitely work to try and get you those answers uh, with our direct contact with ADHS here. Uh, but if you have any other questions that come up after tonight, feel free to send us an email at uh, communications at azmed.org. Uh, resources, just a quick reminder of resources available to you on ARMA's website. Uh, we have an entire page that's being updated daily with resources regarding COVID-19, as well as telemedicine resources, financial related resources, an FAQ that actually Dr. Villarreal and Jessica were very helpful with uh, putting that FAQ together and making sure that we keep uh, adding to it, as well as ARMA's COVID-19 telemedicine guide. Uh, that's downloadable for free on our website. I would like to just take a moment here and thank everyone for their time, especially uh, Dr. Villarreal and Jessica for joining us tonight. Uh, again, ARMA will be, this was recorded. We will be posting this in the next few days uh, for your review. And uh, thank you all. And we hope you have a great evening. <laughs>